President, fellows and guests, it's an enormous pleasure to be with you tonight. I think especially for me as one who is not a fellow of your number. Dora and I created this exhibition very much as a double act. Um, from the word go, we were working on it together. Um, so this talk will, will also be a double act. Um, I'm going to just speak for the first few minutes um, about the origins and concept of the exhibition. Dora uh, will then focus um, on some particular objects that are in it, and then I will return to the podium to talk about a particular object that is not in it, and why. <laughs> As you know, the British Museum has had a wonderful series of exhibitions over the last decade, devoted to many of the great cultures of the world, focused through an individual. It began, the series began with the first emperor exhibition. Hadrian uh, was, a, was a great example. So when it came to the Olympic summer, the year when the world would be coming to London, Neil McGregor thought that the round reading room exhibition should have a British focus. Um, who are the great British figures uh, of, 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 of sufficient recognition and uh, scale and influence to, to be the centre of such an exhibition? Well, the two obvious answers were Queen Elizabeth I and her poet, William Shakespeare. But of course, Queen Elizabeth um, had uh, been the benefit of a wonderful exhibition at Greenwich uh, not so many years ago. Um, so the thought came up, what about an exhibition based on Shakespeare? Now, there had been Shakespeare exhibitions before. Uh, the National Portrait Gallery had a, their exhibition searching for Shakespeare, uh, very much based on portraits and images um, and documents to do with the life of Shakespeare. But of course, a British Museum show is an object-based show. So objects were the place to start. And there was a feeling that if this was to be an appropriate exhibition for um, the, the moment when London met the world once again in 2012, it should be an exhibition about how London met the world in 1612, using Shakespeare as an extraordinary pair of eyes that opened up the early modern world. So although the way the exhibition has ended up does broadly trace a narrative line through Shakespeare's life. In the early part, you're in the Forest of Arden. As you progress, you go through his Elizabethan plays to his Jacobean plays. And the central theme in the exhibition is the change in styles and preoccupation that came to Shakespeare's acting company in 1603, when James came to the throne. And the exhibition ends at the end of Shakespeare's career with The Tempest, his final solo authored play, and the play that he looks out to wider worlds, to the brave new world. But although it has that broad biographical structure, and there are objects associated with Shakespeare's life, including the only bit of literary manuscript surviving in his hand, the single page from the collaborative play of Sir Thomas more. Despite all that, the canvas of the exhibition is very much wider. We developed ideas for it in a wonderful series of seminars led by Neil McGregor, in which curators from many different departments of the museum came together, and I was parachuted in to provide the Shakespearean expertise. And we brainstormed how we could perform the methodologically quite difficult task of bringing together objects and material culture on the one hand and images and words on the other. Shakespeare's imaginary worlds are not the same as the real worlds of early modern Europe and beyond, but clearly they relate to them. And it's that dialogue between real and imaginary worlds that we explored. Habitually, Shakespeareans begin with the words. Museum curators begin with the objects. The story of our collaboration was how to join the two. We came up with a conception of using Shakespeare's imaginary locations as the focal points for the exhibition. That was my idea. Um, it, we thought we would create these worlds, but then it was over to Dora to find the objects that would fill those worlds. Dora, over to you. 
It's wonderful to see so many of you here today because the principal task that we have this evening is to thank the Society and the Board of Fellowship for the wonderful loans that have come to the exhibition, which alone have made large parts of the exhibition possible, and for the knowledge and scholarly exchanges that's flowed with them. Many people in this room and others beyond have contributed hugely to the task that we've had in writing the book which has underpinned the exhibition, and we're very grateful to you. I thought I'd start, first of all, by talking about some of the loans, all of your loans, in fact, in the exhibition and the kinds of roles they play in the context of the exhibition at the British Museum. First of all, this extraordinary portrait, which in our fellow Jill Franklin's words shows the discredited and misbegotten Tudor villain, Richard III. It normally hangs, as you know, at the back of this room, and it's wonderful to have it in the exhibition where it's been drawing a great deal of attention. Fascinating because it is a palimpsest of Richard III's reputation. Only the savagely broken sword of state, indicating his broken rule, has not been overpainted. And I'm very grateful to Jill Franklin for allowing me to see her as yet unpublished catalogue entry from the forthcoming catalogue of paintings of the society. It is absolutely the painting to illustrate Shakespeare's dictator Richard III, every tale condemns me for a villain. The underdrawing reveals that the left shoulder was raised as you still see it, but there was also a disproportionately small left arm and a withered left hand, the sinister side of the body, the sinister character of Richard III. Um, it's really caused a great deal of attention in the exhibition, proving the point, I think, if you needed an example, that uh, the English famously get their theology from Milton and their history from Shakespeare. Um, in the exhibition, we have put it next to a very interesting performance by John Joe O'Neill, who's recently played Richard III at the RSC. You see uh, on the screen in front of you, John Joe O'Neill taking on as the tutors would call it, deformity, his disability, um, acting the part that his disability gives him, saying that he is unable to prove a lover and therefore is determined to prove a villain. And he goes in and out of his disability. You see him raising his left shoulder and putting his hand and arm into exactly the position that it has in the portrait alongside. It's really wonderful to see these two things together. It's a way, which I hope you'll feel is justified, of trying to bring text to the object, the portrait from the society in the exhibition. And people do look back and forth from the performance back to the picture and then back again. And it has its own particular groupies who come in and see it at regular intervals. I wonder if they're members of the various rich third societies. We also have the processional cross belonging to the society shown in relationship to that painting which was found around 1788 on the site of what was then thought to be the Battle of Bosworth uh, site. At that point, of course, it's absolutely entrenched in the English national consciousness, the view that Shakespeare gives us that um, Henry VII rescues England uh, for another period of national greatness from long period of, of civil war and division. Um, and we also show it, uh, one of the interesting things about the way we show it in the exhibition is that you can see on the back of the roundels of the evangelists the Yorkist badge of Sunburst, very beautifully lit by Alan Farley, the exhibition designer. You can really show people how Shakespeare plays on that dual meaning of sun, as in sun and air, and the sun itself in the play. We also show a boar badge, not this one, but the silver one from Chiddingly, which came to us through the Treasure Act in 2002. While we were writing this chapter, this one turned up at Upton in Leicestershire, two miles from the official battle site just acquired by the um, Bosworth Battlefield uh, Heritage Centre. And it just showed that uh, the power of Richard III still in the national imagination, all these references back to Shakespeare that were made when this object was found, and it was wonderful to be able to illustrate it in the, in the uh, book rather than in the exhibition. But the resonance of Richard's identification with his badge, the most deadly boar, is one that's very powerful in the play. Some people believe that the site on which this boar badge was found marks the point where Richard III was actually killed on the battlefield. So it just shows how keen people are to get in touch with Richard III. A third object uh, from the antiquaries, a very small beautiful little lamp known as the lamp of knowledge. I think it normally sits on that um, fireplace over there. Uh, perhaps the odd one out in terms of the loans 
at the exhibition because nobody really understood why I wanted to have it. The reason is that it is thought to be a Jewish Sabbath lamp from the period before the Edict of Expulsion of 1290, uh, where the Jews were expelled from England after a long period of um, anti-Semitism and public and political financial pressure. If it is a Sabbath lamp, uh, if it is a Jewish Sabbath lamp, then it really does speak of that lost community in England at the time when Shakespeare is writing. We've used it in the exhibition in that way to suggest that Shakespeare is not getting any knowledge of Jews and Jewish tradition and Judaism from living and professing Jews in London because they weren't really there. He's looking to the Muranos, the converts um, to Catholicism and Protestantism from the Jewish diaspora from Spain and Portugal, for his ideas about Shylock and this high-paced Jew moving freely in Christian society. But he's also looking at the Bible and um, the biblical account in the Old Testament, from hearing the Bishop's Bible read in church, from reading and studying the Geneva Bible. And we actually show the Geneva Bible alongside this object in the exhibition to look at the way in which Shakespeare uses the story of Laban and his sheep when Shylock's justifying his usury. That's the, the similarity that he, the comparison that he makes. So a very important object in the exhibition in showing uh, how Shakespeare was working when preparing his character, Shylock. Fourth object from the society, uh, Gipkin's superb diptych of Old St. Paul's from around 1616, illustrating Farley's poem in which the cathedral itself pleads for its own restoration. Such a well-known painting from the exhibition making history, and of course the exhibition making history, I should say, is a crucial part of the research we did on this exhibition or on the book. Um, the phrase making history is now one you can use very widely in, with different audiences, and I think that's largely due to the success of the Antiquary's own exhibition. This is used in the exhibition to, in our exhibition, to talk about public preaching as a form of public theatre, as an alternative kind of spectacle in London. Tuning the pulpits is a really important part of governing the country and of governing London. And this is also the site where Henry Garnet is executed after the gunpowder plot. So it has all sorts of different resonances within the exhibition but also belonged to John Dunn, and it's wonderful to be able to put it together with the portrait of John Dunn from the National Portrait Gallery. Many visitors have been very excited to see two paintings um, that belonged to John Dunn in the exhibition. On the back of it, of course, um, Gitkin shows us this very public ceremonial view of London with James in procession uh, across from Southwark, across London Bridge to St Paul's Cathedral. And what I hadn't realised before the object came to the exhibition, and I should have done because of Pamela Tudor Craig's excellent article on the Gipkin diptych, is that Gipkin has actually done um, an interesting little bit of censorship here. He's kind of rubbed out the red light, red light district and substituted the rose and globe theatres and the bear baiting pit for churches. So churches in place of those uh, rather uh, naughty places of ill repute on the South Bank, which I find very interesting, He's also taken away the heads of decapitated traitors on spikes on London Bridge, which is another part of going to the theatre and going to the suburbs, is walking underneath the heads of decapitated traitors, which apparently Londoners are very proud to point out if they had a relative whose head was up there. I don't think Londoners have changed very much. Um, and I'm glad to say that, not as a result of the exhibition, but flowing from the work on the exhibition, Edward Tan, who's here tonight from the NPG, has got fascinating new archival material on Gipkin, which we're hoping he will publish soon. So there's a lot of new information um, around and about this fascinating diptych, which we'll soon see the light of day. From that Gipkin diptych, which is such an interesting, moralizing, Protestant civic picture of around 1616, makes an interesting comparison and contrast, I think, with this huge Fioletti panorama of Venice which I'm very glad to say we were able to persuade the Protestant Fellows of Eton to lend to us. Um, Henrietta Ryan is here today, Keeper of Eton Collections, and I think Ruth Bob, who did the conservation on the painting, is here as well. Um, we're very grateful to them. Ruth did the most superb program of conservation on this painting and liberated it from what appeared to me to be layers of kind of treacle-coloured varnish. So now that you can see the details in very much, much better um, 
more, more freely coloured than you could ever see them before. It is now truly, as Sir Henry Wotton called his own picture of Venice, the city that seems to float. Um, and it has, it has also been signed by Eduardo Fialetti and dated 1611, here under the detail of the Redentore, that has just emerged during the cleaning, which was, um, I believe, supported by the Friends of Eton College Collections. Our thanks to them, too. But too late for the book, alas, but not too late to be included on the label for the painting and the exhibition, this superb little detail in the piazzetta of St. Mark's of players in performance. Now, Ruth is writing this up for a book which I'm glad to say is going to be dedicated entirely to the Fioletti painting, edited by Deborah Howard, professor in Cambridge University, and by Henrietta Ryan, which is going to come out um, sometime next year, I think in the autumn of 2013, from Paul Holberton Publishing. Um, that's going to look at every aspect of this painting and its intellectual context. But Ruth Bard discovered this detail at the geometrical center of this picture in its original format, and it's never really been seen before. What's represented is a makeshift temporary platform in the piazzetta with four figures up on the platform. Now, there are two interpretations. It could be a mummaria or a kind of uh, wedding mask or wed theatrical performance to celebrate a wedding. Very Shakespearean if it is, if you think of the end of The Tempest and the wonderful mask that Prospero conjures up for the marriage of Ferdinand and Miranda. Or it could be charlatans or mountebanks at work commercially selling their wares, peddling their um, quack medicines in the piazzetta. For that, we have very good contemporary evidence that there were charlatans in performance twice a day in the piazzetta of St. Mark, and English visitors are particularly enthralled to them. It's very much on the tourist trail, a bit like Thomas Corrick tells us, uh, trying your hand at blowing glass in the Murano glass houses. So it's a similar activity. And here we have Giacomo Franco's uh, print of 1610 in the British Museum showing charlatans in performance. And you see a set of the different platforms with different charlatans performing. And what's really interesting here, um, several things, but most of all, the fact that there are commedia dell'arte figures. Um, the servant, the master, and the inamorata, or the loved one, probably a courtesan playing a musical instrument, and the mountebank brandishing a snake. Uh, we hear from contemporary accounts of these performers that um, one of the tricks was to be apparently bitten by a snake and then cure yourself with your own quack patent medicine, uh, a nice little bit of theatre. And you'll see also a figure on the left who's got a trunk on a stand traveling trunk, out of which he is taking perhaps one of the quack medicines to pass into the crowd. The crowd is also carefully labeled and categorized for you. So you have Inglesi, English to the right, and Turks next to them in a very interesting way. And so this is the kind of picture postcard view of Venice that Venetians are producing for their own consumption and for the tourist trade. And it really is going around Europe, this imagery. It's very famous Venetian imagery. This is one um, version of one of these scenes. I think I know of eight so far, and I haven't looked, haven't had time to look very hard yet. I'm sure there are many more to find. This is from a, an album, Amicorum, one, a friendship album, in the Bamberg University Library, an unknown compiler around 1600, and it shows mountebanks in performance. You see the chest again, but what you really see here is an assistant, perhaps, to the mountebank, or the mountebank himself throwing what look like unflying objects into the crowd. We know from contemporary accounts that if you wanted to buy something from the mountebank while the performance was going on, or the committed a lot of figures, or while the sales pattern was going on, you could hand money up in your glove or tied up in a handkerchief, and the change would be thrown back into the crowd, tied up in a handkerchief or in a glove in the same way, or passed back through the onlookers, uh, along with the medicine that you just acquired. So you can see what a kind of exchange there is with the crowd. Interesting that this is definitely a Venetian setting because the two characters in the red long robe and the black long robe at the front are wearing Venetian dress. But there's also um, a peddler figure, a black African with his dog on the left-hand side watching the performance. And actually in quite a few of these performances, quite a few of these uh, depictions of mountebanks at work, in Venice, particularly in an Italian Catholic setting, 
there's a sort of Protestant disapproval quite often of what's going on. Um, and you get that also in the written accounts of these things. Take a good look at that trunk, though, and the trunk that we saw in the Franco print, because here you see me playing the mountebank with a very rare surviving trunk of around 1600, maybe later, from Stonyhurst College in Lancashire in the library there with Jan Grafius, whose blue paper you've just heard mentioned in the back, arranging vestments, which also came to the exhibition. This trunk is made out of softwood covered with pony skin with a domed cover in an attempt to make it waterproof. It's got old carrying handles. It's missing its uh, lock plate at the front because somebody presumably ripped that out as a valuable fitting. It was found walled into the wall of a safe Catholic house, Salmsbury Hall, near Blackburn in Lancashire, around 1850, passed into the Myerscough family and was given by one of the Jesuits in the Myerscough family to Stonyhurst College around the First World War. And it's been there ever since. When it was found, it was completely stuffed with everything that a whole gener generations of Catholic priests, Jesuits in Lancashire, would need to say mass and to minister to their communities. Um, fascinating vestments, probably made out of women's clothing, patched and mended, uh, corporals, everything that you need to say mass on the move for the community. I'm just going to show you some of those things in a minute. Um, we showed this object and its contents, this headless trunk as it's called, and its contents in two registers in the exhibition. First of all, against red, the Catholic colour of martyrdom, as a travelling mass kit, a very rare travelling mass kit from the 17th century, probably from the early 17th century, that may have been used right into the end of the 1600s. And we show it here with the green vestments that have come out of the trunk that are used for most ordinary Catholic masses, and the uh, chalice and the travelling altar, um, and we show the, the trunk open to show some of the other contents that are used by a priest on the move. And of course, Catholic priests are the ultimate outsiders in Shakespeare's England. Uh, they are regarded almost as terrorists. If they're caught, they're interrogated, they can be tortured, and then they're executed as traitors. So they are pretty well the terrorists of Shakespeare's England in the eyes of Protestant authorities. But we also show this object in another register with a quotation on the wall behind, come to the peddler. This is Autolycus, the peddler figure in The Winter's Tale, Shakespeare's play, encouraging his buyers to approach him so he can give them these wonderful gaudy sales banter and flog handkerchiefs and sheets to them. And this is thought to be um, something like what peddlers dragged around if they were lucky enough to have pack horses and mules on the unpoliced ways that went between fairs and towns particularly in Lancashire, where they still survive those tracks, you can still walk them. And those, of course, were the tracks that the Catholic priests used too. Just to talk about the mass kit first, here is the pewter chalice and the travelling altar. There are even uh, mass or missiles at Stonyhurst from about this period, but I think the earliest one is 1606, which are made for the Catholic English mission which show you how to consecrate a travelling altar so that it can be used for this, just this sort of purpose, for carrying around as you minister to your different communities. And just the sorts of goods that we find in the peddler's trunk um, are listed as Ambrose Rookwood's goods seized at Clopton House in Shakespeare's own Warwickshire just after the gunpowder plot, 6th November 1605. And there you get a silver gilt chalice, rather grander, cross of copper with a picture of Christ on it with one altar stone, two white surfaces, one old sheet, a pair of praying beads of bone, and all kept in an old cloak bag so you can lug it around quickly and hide it, keep it on the move. Catholic priests are always having to move around. They're always in hiding. Since the trunk came to the exhibition, I've been able to identify the wallpaper that lines it. And it's a scene of a fragment of wallpaper of a stag hunt as a piece in the DNA from Clandon House of Surrey. It's a later 17th century wallpaper. So either this trunk has been relined, and you know it was heavily used for generations, so it may be that it has an early trunk of about 1600, 1620 has been relined, or the trunk is a later trunk from the 17th century, made to a design which we know from other sources is quite a common design from around 1600. Either way, it's quite fun to be able to identify the paper, and there's quite a lot of the paper in the trunk, which should be properly recorded, and I hope will be. 
is it really a peddler's trunk? We approached Margaret Spufford, the great expert on Chapman and peddlers, and she's looked at 240 inventories of 17th century Chapman, and she says she's never come across a trunk quite like this one, or indeed anybody who has anything that might approach vestments in their collections, in their inventories. But I suppose that's not really surprising. Um, much more likely that Autolycus would be carrying around a pack, a heavily laden pack on his back, as you see this figure in the middle left of Eustemar and Hans Sachs' print from the Book of Trades. Uh, probably that kind of pack is much more likely to be what Autolycus has when he says, my trade is sheets. And of course, what these peddlers are doing is supplying things, domestic luxuries like sheets to the middling sort, who are beyond the reach of many of the towns through the fairs and the peddlers' networks. But there's an interesting Catholic and confessional wing to Autolycus's wares in the Winter's, the Winter's Tale. And I've just put in italics the words here that seem to be to have some faint Catholic resonance to them. He's obviously just talking about how gullible his customers are, and how they leap upon these things as if they were things that were going to bring them special privileges um, and so on. But it's an interesting resonance given the way that peddlers and Catholic priests are often regarded as thinks in the popular imagination. When Simon Foreman goes to see The Winter's Tale at the Globe in 1611, and we have the diary open at this page in the exhibition, he draws a moral from the behavior of Autolycus, this terrible, deceitful peddler who steals and tricks and preys on the poor and the gullible, including a row of shepherds. He takes a moral from it, beware of trusting feigned beggars or fawning fellows. And that sense of feigned and fawning is very important for the way in which peddlers are regarded, both on stage and in reality, with all the various acts of the 17th century that are intended to control them and their movements. And there is a link with Catholic priests because Catholic priests are also having to feign um, counterfeit uh, find disguises for themselves, and it's inescapable in the eyes of Protestant satirists the way that Catholics have these many, many identities, Catholic priests, which come up when they're tried. So when Henry Garnet, the great Jesuit, is tried at the Guildhall uh, for allegedly having a part in the gunpowder plot, all his aliases are trotted out, and there are a huge number of them. Um, one of them is Farmer. And one wonders whether that's the explanation behind an otherwise odd reference in the Porter speech in Macbeth to a farmer who hanged himself in the expectation of plenty. If that Porter's speech, if that interlude in Macbeth is, as James Shapiro recently suggested, uh, the devil, the Porter, inviting Garnet to join him in hell, then it makes quite an interesting set of resonances. And this superb and unique front page of a broadside, which survives in the British Museum, showing Henry Garnet, the Jesuit, as the Prince of Traitors holding the Pope's pardon for treasonable action against an anointed king in his hand, shows him as a kind of devil figure. Um, this shows some of the associations of anti-Catholic satire at the time of the gunpowder plot. So does this medal, which I think I should have included in the exhibition, though we refer to it in the note in the book. This is a medal uh, made in Holland just after the discovery of the gunpowder plot at the moment when the Jesuits are expelled from Holland. And it shows the Jesuit snake revealed, creeping out from under the undergrowth, with the Latin legend, he who concealed himself is detected. Actually likening a Jesuit priest or Jesuit priest to the devil himself. Of course, Samuel Harsnett in his Declaration of Egregious Popish and Postures, which we know Shakespeare uses as a source for Lear, talks about Jesuits traveling as tinkers do with their bitches, peddling exorcists of the rascal crew, he mentions one Jesuit in Lancashire, who wandered like a chap in a small wares with a wench and a truss, another word for a trunk. So you get these associations with a very humble and ordinary object like this. Um, I just wanted to show how, just because of accident of survival, a very ordinary object like this, which is ubiquitous in Shakespeare's world, used by anyone in their, for their household stuff, used by anyone on the road, can also have these interesting social and intellectual contexts, perhaps an association with mountebanks, association with peddlers, certainly an association with Catholic priests as a traveling mass kit. And I wonder 
when Ben Johnson's Bold Permit stands up on the platform, the makeshift platform, supposedly in St. Mark's Square, on the London stage, and pretends to be a Scota Mantua, the famous mountebank, and he refers to selling discounted wares from his chest. Is this something like Volpone's trunk, Volpone's chest? I just suggest the question. Either way, it certainly takes us back to Fioletti's extraordinary panorama of Venice and that performance at the heart of it. And that link between the London Playhouse and the London Playhouse's view of Venice as this ultimate city is one that's very strong in the exhibition, very strong in the book, and very strong in Shakespeare's world. And at that point, I hand over to Jonathan. Now, John, Dora said to me as I arrived in her office at the museum for one of our morning meetings to discuss what was going to go into the exhibition. We've got all these wonderful imported objects that have come to London. We have all these people who have come to London from different countries, whether they're traders, tourists, or immigrant craftsmen. One of the really striking things about the show is how many of the portraits and other objects were made by typically Huguenot migrant craftsmen who had fetched up in London, escaping the religious wars on the continent. We've got all this, but what about Shakespeare's plays going out to the world? Shakespeare being performed elsewhere in the world. Shouldn't we end the exhibition Shakespeare staging the world by saying something about how the world staged Shakespeare? Well, I said to Dora, um, the most famous example of an overseas performance of a Shakespeare play in his lifetime is the performance of Hamlet on board the ship Red Dragon en route to the East Indies at anchor off the coast of Sierra Leone. Now Dora knew a little bit about this story, but whereas I move in the gullible world of literary critics, Dora moves in the hard-headed world of historians and antiquaries. And she knew that some of the historians were a little skeptical of this story. And it has to be said that literary historians have not been so skeptical. The great scholarly edition of Shakespeare is the Arden Shakespeare, the authoritative work. If you read the performance history of Hamlet in the latest iteration of Arden, Arden series three, it begins categorically stating the first recorded performance of Hamlet was off the coast of Sierra Leone in 1607. I mean, even that is not quite right, because, of course, Hamlet was published in the Quarto uh, in 1604 uh, with the statement on the title page performed before the two universities of Oxford and Cambridge. I think the point that the Arden editor was making was that we don't know the specific dates or colleges of those performances. And there is uh, an enormous amount of recent work by post-colonial scholars relishing this encounter between uh, the, the British imperialists, uh, the slavers, you can, you can imagine it. Um, but very little scepticism. However, Dora set me a challenge. She said, well, we must have this. We must, uh, uh, where, where is the record of this performance? So I said, well, it was in, in the ship's log. Uh, it was called Captain Keeling. Um, the ship's log uh, is a voyage to the East Indies. I, I'd imagine his logbook must be in the library of the East India Company. So I go off to the library of the East India Company, no sign of it. Ah, well, I come back. I say to I'm afraid it looks as though the original ship's log is lost. However, the story of that voyage is in Perkis' his pilgrimage. You remember in 1625, um, Samuel Perkis published a huge book that was a sequel to Hacklewit's voyages. And it was called uh, Hacklewit Posthumous, uh, another series of voyages. Uh, and among those is indeed uh, a narrative of the voyage of the Red Dragon to the East Indies. Ah, I said, this must be where it is. We, we can't have the original logbook, but we can have the account of it in a lovely folio of Perkis 1625. Go through the voyage very carefully, and there are many extracts from Captain Keeling's journal. No sign of the account of the performance of Hamlet. So I started digging. And I discovered the first record of this performance 
came um, in a Victorian collection by someone called Richard Rundle, published in 1849, called Narr Narratives of Voyages to, to the Northwest Passage and, 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 and other, other Voyages. However, what I discovered when I looked at that book was that the account of the Shakespearean performances were not integrated within a voyage narrative, but they were merely among a series of, of appendices. And one of them was a short appendix, uh, which said that on, on the ships traveling to the East Indies, there was sometimes a taste for plays, um, as is seen by the following passage um, in Captain Keeling's journal. And then there's a quote. 1607, September the 4th, at Sierra Leone. Towards night, the king's interpreter came and brought me a letter from the Portingale, um, wherein he offered me all kindly services. The bearer is a man of marvellous ready wit and speaks in elegant Portuguese. He laid aboard me. September the 5th. I sent the interpreter, according to his desire, aboard the Hector. The Hector was another ship that was sailing with the Red Dragon. Where he broke fast and after came aboard me, where we gave the tragedy of Hamlet. September the 30th. Captain Hawkins dined with me, where my companions acted King Richard II, and September the 31st. I invited Captain Hawkins to a fish dinner and had Hamlet acted aboard me, which I permit to keep my people from idleness and unlawful games or sleep. <clears throat> well, so far so good, but no context, no manuscript. I dug some more. And uh, that, that fact does seem to have been the moment at which this narrative enters Shakespearean scholarship. So various late Victorian um, Shakespearean scholars pick up on it. Um, but in 1877, Clements Markham, another antiquary working on voyages, published his Voyages of Sir James Lancaster, in the course of which he cast doubt on the authenticity of the physical. He described Keeling's diary in the library of the East India Company, but said it existed in fragmentary form. It broke off suddenly in the middle of an entry on 30th of August, 1607, and only resumed on the 18th of February, 1608. The Shakespearean performances then were in the mysteriously absent page. He also noted but another journal um, from people on board the Red Dragon, uh, Messrs. Hearn and Finch, was extant for the September time and made no mention of the performances. And in addition, Captain Hawkins of the Hector, the very other captain who was invited to the Second Hamlet performance, his journal is extant for the entire trip. No references to the Shakespearean performances. The great early 20th century Shakespearean biographer, Sidney Lee, was skeptical um, of the, the, the Randall account for, for this reason. But on the whole, the balance of the argument uh, accepted the authenticity. And this was bolstered in the 1950s when an almost identical quotation of the passage was discovered to have been published earlier than Randall's account was published in the European magazine in 1825, but it was only in the 1950s that, it was, that this, this was noted. Now, this would seem to be proof of authenticity. How could Rundle have created, invented, forged the document in 1849 if it had already been published in 1825? However, the context in which it was first published in 1825 was rather curious. It appears in the form of a P.S. to an essay on an altogether different subject. The essay is called A Running Commentary on the Hamlet of 1603. And it was published on the occasion of the discovery of the Duke of Devonshire's copy of the Hamlet Quarto. And also the publication for the first time uh, in that year of 1825 um, of the text of the so-called Bad Quarto of Hamlet the 1603 quarto that scholars now believe is some form of memorial reconstruction of an early version of Hamlet. 
The piece is signed Ambrose Guntio, which was clearly um, a pen name, a pseudonym. It contains some very astute scholarly analysis of various points of detail in Hamlet, and indeed proposes for the first time that the bad quarter of Hamlet is a memorial reconstruction. But then it has this curious P.S. P.S. May I venture to propound to your learned correspondence two queries quite equal in importance to many points which have been gravely debated by the commentators. In primis, should not the representative of Hamlet be a stout man, a kind of Jack Falstaff, seeing that the Queen, during the fencing match, observes he's fat and scant of breath? So the first uh, PS there is, we think of Hamlet as the thin, dark-clad, melancholy figure, but actually the Queen says during the, the duel scene, he's fat in Scantabra. Shouldn't Hamlet be fat? But then secondly, like a woman's PS, mine shall include the most choice thing. I have to communicate, viz, sorry, the most choice thing I have to communicate, viz, the light of the bring it <laughs> Viz, three extracts from a journal kept on board the ship Dragon by Captain Keeling, one of the earliest commanders employed by the East India Company, in whose library the manuscript is preserved. They seem to show that Hamlet was then, as now, preferred by most people to end before any other play in the proportion of at least two to one. And he then goes on to say the, actor, the great actor, um, the, 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 the great actor Kemble um, had said to his biographer Bowdoin that it was always the case that Hamlet was performed twice as often as any other play. So as evidence of the fact that Hamlet's always been twice as popular as any other play, uh, we get now to my extracts from Keeling, September the 5th, 1607. I sent the Portuguese interpreter according to his desire aboard the Hector, where he broke fast and after came aboard me, where we had the tragedy of Hamlet. And in the afternoon, we went all together ashore to see if we could shoot an elephant. <laughs> September the 29th, 1607, Captain Hawkins dined with me when my company acted King Richard II. March the 31st, 1608, I invited Captain Hawkins to a fish dinner and had Hamlet acted aboard me, which I permit to keep my people from idleness and unlawful games of sleep. So QED, three performances on the Red Dragon in 1607, two of Hamlet, one of Richard II. Therefore, Hamlet was originally, as it always has been, twice as popular as any other Shakespeare play. Clearly, clearly, this is a joke. The question then is, who is Ambrose Guntio? who made the joke. The observation that the bad quarto of Hamlet was an actor's memorial reconstruction. The suggestion that the actor who plays Hamlet should be fat. There is only one scholar in the first half of the 19th century who makes these points. It is in his edition of Hamlet, his commentary, on it. Um, and indeed, almost every point that Ambrose Guntio makes um, about Hamlet is repeated in that edition and commentary. The man in question is none other than John Payne Collier, a great scholar, but also the most notorious Shakespearean forger of the 19th century. That in itself ought to be enough to make that fish dinner very fishy indeed. <laughs> but there is, I think, further evidence that Ambrose Guntio is Collier. One of the joys of our modern digital world is that you can go to Google Books and get a pretty good sampling of early printed sources. So I typed Ambrose Guntio into a Google book search, and it's not the kind of name that would throw up many red herrings, but I duly found a couple of Ambrose Guntio's other pieces of journalism in the Theatrical Inquisitor in 1816, exactly the time when John Payne Collier was beginning to review plays, publish in magazines. Um, there is uh, a, uh, some, a series of extracts from a book that Guntio claims he's working on called The Dictionary of Love and Wooer's Vade Macon, 
which is a kind of early glossary um, of some of the rather saucy double entendre with which the plays of Shakespeare and his contemporaries are filled. And of course, Collier was one of the first great um, scholars of the wider repertoire of early modern drama. Again, in Oxbury's Flowers of Literature, or Encyclopedia of Anecdote, 1822, there is a further extract from the supposed lover's dictionary that Ambrose is compiling, again, revealing uh, a knowledge of a very wide range of obscure 16th and 17th century plays from Gamma, Girton, Needle, a play that Folly was particularly interested in, onwards. And then again, and perhaps decisively, in that same European magazine in 1826, we find, again, Ambrose Guntio, Punch and Judy, a philosophical poem in two cantos. Two years later, John Payne Collier became the first scholar to write down the Punch and Judy dialogue the, the, from that, that popular theatre tradition, that oral tradition. Collier's Punch and Judy, published in 1828 with engravings by Cruikshank, enormously popular document, reprinted many, many times throughout the 19th century, the absolute basis of the, the historiography of the Punch and Judy. It does seem, it would seem an extraordinary coincidence if Ambrose Guntio um, happened to share an interest in Fat Hamlet, Bad Quarto Hamlet, Punch and Ju Judy, and other minor early modern plays, and to be someone other than Collier. We also know that Collier, who was a friend, of course, of Charles Lamb, um, had access to the East India Library. All of a sudden, um, the, the hallmarks of Collier, that combination of genuine antiquarian scholarship of enormous value, and an irresistible urge to forge, to invent, to write famed marginalia, to tear out pages and replace them with his own fake. All the hallmarks are there. Surely that missing page that was identified by Clements Markham was replaced by Collier with his own little joke, slipped back in, and then seen by the gullible Rundle in 1849. Alas, the journal of Keeley is altogether lost now, so we, we, we can't absolutely um, establish that. But as I told this story to Dora, she nodded sagely and said, well, the historians, especially the African historians, have, or, have always had doubts about this. And if you think about the plausibility of the story, um, what have they got? A single quarto copy of, 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 of Hamlet? Has someone, is someone sitting down and copying out all the parts? When are they performing it? The, the account seems to suggest it, it's in the heat of the afternoon, which seems an unlikely time. And what about that detail of going ashore to shoot an elephant, which curiously Rundle leaves out of his version. One suspects um, uh, Rundle left it out because he's only trying to illustrate the point about performing plays. Collier, one does strongly suspect, puts it in because it's a, a witty way of suggesting something of his imagined version of the, the atmosphere of the African coast in the early 70s. So what is the moral of the story? Um, it is that people who work with objects and want the real thing are very, very concerned to get the facts straight, to get the date right. By searching for the object and not finding it, we found that the object was not really there. And the stage history of Hamlet, and indeed Richard II, and indeed the wider assumptions about Shakespeare reaching the wider world will need to be rewritten. So in a way, we didn't quite get the ending we wanted for the exhibition. I think the, uh, the, the, the glimmer of an idea was that we would have the narrative of that first performance of Hamlet, the first time, Hamlet re the first, the first time Shakespeare reaches Africa, beside the object that we do have at the end of the exhibition, which is the tattered copy of the complete works of Shakespeare which was held by the prisoners in Robben Island during the apartheid era with Nelson Mandela's signature and those of the other prisoners each signing the passage in Shakespeare that meant most to them. We, we weren't able to bring those two objects, Robben Island, 1979, Sierra Leone, 1607 together. But what we did bring together at the end of the exhibition was a first folio, 1623, 
and Robin Island Bible, 1979. Because the first folio, of course, is the document that is the rock solid basis of all that we do know of the complete works of Shakespeare. Thank you.